And for those who are new on the call or might not be familiar with advanced clinical training, we do offer fully online simulation-based and instructor-led trainings for students who are looking for direct patient care. And you can expect to um, learn in an interactive asynchronous format to gain all the skills necessary to enter into an entry-level position in as little as eight to 12 weeks. So if you're still looking out or shopping around and hoping to find what's out there, I'm happy to tell you that we are one of the best or the best um, in terms of providing online certification courses. And we hope you choose us to support you in your pre-health journey. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Caroline. She is a physician assistant with over eight years of experience as a registered dietitian nutritionist. She is passionate about nutrition and wellness and also sharing valuable insights on several of her social media platforms. She has appeared on several major news broadcasts, including CBS and USA Today, and is actively mentoring aspiring healthcare professionals. And we're super excited to hear from Caroline today how she made the career switch from being a dietitian to a PA. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janie. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. If something changes with the audio throughout, just drop a note in the chat. I'm trying to keep an eye on that. But I'm so excited to be here today. And um, I gave a couple talks about wellness a few months ago. And so hopefully some of you are repeat listeners and viewers tonight. I'm really excited to share my personal experience and talk to you all about career pivots because it's something I like to think I know something about. So with that, I will share my screen to uh, get the slides going. Um, I want this to be a really informal talk. Um, and so, you know, I want everybody to feel like they can can chime in and, and engage in the in the chat. I'm going to ask you some questions. I know you can't necessarily, you know, speak up with a microphone, but if you guys feel comfortable um, introducing yourself in the chat, that would be great. So as Janie said, um, and can somebody let me know if you can see my slides before I before I get started? Yep, I can see it. Perfect. All right. Um, so as Janie mentioned, I started my career um, actually in something other than healthcare altogether. So I'll talk to you about my whole trajectory, but I don't want this to be about, about me. I want to hear from you and see if any of this resonates with any of you. But um, as Janie said, I, I started my career in healthcare out as a registered dietitian nutritionist and today still maintain that credential. And um, you'll kind of see throughout this talk, why I decided to further my career and um, expand my credentials uh, into medicine. And since doing so, I haven't looked back. So we're going to be talking about career pivots today. So um, as Janie said, my name's Caroline. I am Midwest based right now. And, um, you know, I've always thought of myself as a pretty eclectic person with a lot of different interests. And obviously I enjoy healthcare, but I don't let that define me. And so I think, you know, it's, it's important. We're so work driven, especially a lot of us in the chats here who are focused, um, you know, maybe you're pursuing a certain degree or a certain path. And I think it's just really important to always remind yourself that applications, you know, program directors, if you're looking to apply to say medical school or respiratory therapy program or whatever it is, they love well-rounded characters. And so keep in mind, don't lose sight of your passions and hobbies. Um, I think it's really important in what sets you apart. So um, I, in the span of my career, um, though I like to think I'm still pretty young, but in the span of my career, I have career pivoted not once, but twice. Um, and tonight I'm going to tell you how and why I did that. Um, really tonight, what I want all of you to get out of this talk is to just learn about some possible different career paths in healthcare. Obviously, I don't know where each of you are or where your passions lie, but um, hopefully this will give some insight into a couple different options um, and sort of serve as almost like a virtual job shadowing because I'll talk to you about my work, not only as a registered dietitian, but also a physician assistant now. Um, and then, you know, just some overall arching, overarching themes of tonight. I want this phrase to kind of stick in your mind. And that is that I think you're going to learn tonight that you should never say never in life and you should never say never in your career. There have been so many instances in my own career where I thought, wow, I, I never thought I'd be working in this area or I never thought I'd do this. And lo and behold, life just had it. And, and now I am. So 
I want also tonight that uh, another theme of the talk is that I think it's always important to understand the power of connections and networking and you are as strong as your personal network, both professionally and socially. And so learning how to harness that to your advantage, I think is so important. And then, um, you know, we'll try to share some resources where I can. So first, before I dive into my own story, I just want to do kind of like an audience pulse check to stay within the theme of healthcare. Um, and I'd really like to get all get to know all of you better. So I just want to take a few moments. I'll take a sip of my coffee, but I would love if you could just throw in the chat um, just in like a one liner, maybe what you feel comfortable sharing. So if that's like your name, perfect, where you're located. And I, and I want to know what interests you in terms of what track you're on for healthcare. Like um, if you're currently pursuing something, what your goals are. So hopefully I will hear some people chime in. And if not, we'll get started. But I, when I, whenever I get a talk, give a talk, I like to know my audience and, um, so I think that's helpful. Awesome. We've got our first, first uh, sharer, Emily based in Dallas, Texas. Awesome. I've applied to PA programs this cycle. Oh, you're in the interviewing process. This will be my third career pivot. That is insane. Wow. Congratulations. You have me beat. Um, Sharon from Michigan. Great. Jenna. Cool. PA specializing in dermatology. I love it, Jenna. I did a derm rotation. So if you have specific questions, I'm happy to help. Um, Elizabeth, currently a dietitian based in Michigan, contemplating PA school, still not sure. Okay. Very good. Any other takers? Any other sharers? Michaela from Texas, PA is a goal. Awesome. Deirdre, are you applying to PA school? Isabel, California, getting patient care experience. Yes, that is a theme of tonight. I want everybody to realize it's so important. Natalie's in dietetic school, considering PA school maybe. Hey, Miguel, integrative science pre-med track. Good for you. That's awesome. I love it. Interested in PT. Hey, that's great. Pre-PA track. Yes to PA. Okay, so we've got a lot of PAs in the pre-PAs, PA track in the audience. This is awesome. R and MD to PA. Wow. That is, that is amazing. So great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for everybody sharing um, a little bit about what they do. Um, you know, some of you, I wanted to kind of get a sense in this audience pulse check if any of you were in a career pivot or if you've pursued something else and now moving on to the next thing. It sounds like a lot of you had. We've got a third, third timer in the audience. So that's, that's incredible. So sounds like this is the right talk for you guys. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, that was my poll is to hear. So for the person who did three career pivots, if you don't mind sharing all of your past careers and what you did, I would love to love to read that. And I I'm sure everybody else in the audience would be interested too. non-traditional student second time in healthcare. More so school pivot. OK, OK, very good. Any other people in the audience who are contemplating a career pivot? Sounds like a lot of dietitians, maybe to PA would be a career pivot. Any others who have done a career pivot and on their second pivot, maybe? Well, you guys think about it and we'll get started. Perfect. Okay. So um, again, wow, litigation support sales, transitioning to teaching high school chemistry, then began in healthcare. Wow, you guys... You win the, <laughs> the most decorated. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Emily. Um, well, again, you know, I want this talk to not be selfish and just be all about me. I want to hear from a lot of you guys. And if you have any questions toward the end, I'm going to be happy to dive in and try my best to answer. But I think it's nice to always hear about others' experience, especially if some of my journey kind of resonates with you. Maybe you are pre-MD tracked, pre-PA you know, PA track, and just trying to decide what the best fit is for you. And um, <laughs> if I'm any testament, I find it sometimes difficult to know what it is when I want to grow up when I grow up or at least I felt that way a long time ago and so you'll see I've done a lot of unique pivots as well so 
When I was growing up um, in high school, I was a very serious musician, and I always thought that I was going to be a concertizing violist who would travel the world and perform in her quartet. And that was my dream. I, it truly was. I took it really seriously. I played in a professional symphony orchestra when I was in high school. I, I was one of the youngest in the symphony orchestra and just really dove in and took it seriously, was practicing all the time, lived, breathed, and ate music. Um, so I started my journey out actually in a music conservatory or a pseudo conservatory at the Jacobs School of Music in Indiana University. And, you know, for a lot of reasons, I have no regrets and it was an amazing experience. Um, it was a huge school. I don't know if any of you guys know IU, but last time I checked, there's like 80,000 students in the university. And I think there was, at the time that I attended, there were over 3,000 students just in the music school. So it was very much a mill and I very much felt like sort of one of many numbers, if you will. Um, so, you know, there were lots of good and bad to it. Obviously, a lot of the disciplines you learn as a classical musician, such as punctuality and discipline and, you know, um, organization and, and stick to itness, all of that translates in so many aspects of life. Um, but you know, it just, it, it, I found once I got started, it wasn't really the best for me. And there were actually surprisingly in the music conservatory, a lot of unhealthy behaviors and lifestyles being led that I kind of observed and thought, wow, I kind of want to distance myself from this. So while studying music, um, you know, you have music history, music theory, um, you know, all of these different, I, I played in several operas, I was practicing up to eight hours a day, I would literally like have calluses on the tips of my fingers, I got like, you know, whiplash on my neck, just, <laughs> I'm exaggerating, obviously, but practice a lot, spent a lot of my time in a four wall, four little box, uh, a box with four walls, excuse me, practice room. And I'm kind of a people person, or at least I try to be. So a lot of that was eye opening to me. And so out of all those music classes, I only took one science course. And that one science course happened to be a nutrition course. And I absolutely fell in love. And so I thought, wow, I need to reevaluate things. And so I decided to just drop everything completely turn on my self identity, at least that at which I knew it would was to be at the time. And I thought, you know, I am going to start something new, I'm going to take a chance on myself. So I transferred to Iowa State University. It's one of it, it is the only um, university in the state of Iowa where I'm from originally, that you can pursue a coordinated dietetic track. So I really didn't have much of a choice of school to transfer to because I was trying to think frugally and think of finances. So um, I, I trans transitioned and transferred schools, and I know probably some of you can, can resonate with that, uh, to Iowa State and finished my Bachelor of Arts in Music. So I actually did um, simultaneously complete two separate degree tracks at once. So I um, pursued my BS in Dietetics and then my Bachelor of Arts in Music and um, kind of strategically did that. I had to make a lot of sacrifices in college because I performed in a symphony orchestra while studying dietetics. I was in chamber orchestra quartets. I had to give master classes and practices, and it was just a lot on top of studying a rigorous science course. And um, But I did it because that scholarship that I got for music helped pay my way through dietetic school. So it was kind of this own little sacrifice I did to myself. And, you know, I never lost the love of music, so I wanted to finish that. Anyway, that's enough to be said. Um, I don't know if many of you are, all of you are familiar with the dietetic track, obviously the dietitians in the audience are, but we um, have a coordinated internship program that we have to fulfill before sitting for our board exam. And I like for the non-dietitian people in the, in the group tonight, I like to take, it's sort of akin to a medical residency, if you will, for nutrition. So it's over a thousand hours of supervised coordinated clinical work and um, very rigorous. And we actually used to use Use the same exact die cast um, application that residents use to match to their residencies. So it's it was a match process and very, very stressful. Um, so I obviously had to complete that coordinated internship before going on to practice as a dietitian. 
Um, so that was my big career pivot number one. That was probably the most stark, right? And I'll talk to you more about the details of how I made that work. But that was a big, a big eye opener for me and, and honestly took a lot of faith in myself to do that. And then obviously, the second pivot was me deciding to go to PA school after several years of practice. And I'll, I'll get in more to that later. But, you know, if any of you in the audience are thinking right now, if you're if you're contemplating in your room someday, and you're just reflecting upon all that you've done in your life and where you want to go. I just want to normalize the fact that in the background, I put these in lower, lower case because I felt so small during this time making pivot number one here. I was thinking, you know, do I have what it takes to make this switch? Who am I even now? I music, as I mentioned earlier, was very much my identity and how I saw myself. I didn't even picture anything else as an option for me. I didn't have any family members in medicine or healthcare, so I was the first one to enter that field. Um, you know, I thought, what if I fail? What do I do? I've always been a, you know, a bit of a type A slash type B person. I, I try to do everything with um, a sense of pride. And, you know, not to mention what others would think of me, what my family would think of me. They were shocked, of course, that I wanted to throw everything away in quotes with music. Um, and then obviously the financial piece, right? How do I pay for this? Um, finances, are very personal. And so everybody has different backgrounds with that and different support systems. But for me, it was a big question mark. So I just want to normalize that it is okay for you to feel all these small emotions and, and have that sense of uncertainty. And um, you just have to really do a lot of self-reflection and constantly check in with yourself to see, are, are you on this right path? Is MD what you want to do? Is pre-med what you want to do? Is PA school what you want to do? Um, because, you know, it, it takes a lot of questions and, and it's sometimes hard to know that uh, in our in our early careers. So, what it looked like for me going from music, and I, I know a lot of this isn't probably the most interesting for you in the audience. I, I think you want to hear more about maybe the PA or the medical side, but I, I will take some time to talk about the pursuit of my dietetic degree for those of you in the audience who are um, nutrition students. Um, it was a lot to go from somebody pursuing just music and a Bachelor of Arts to go to a Bachelor of Science. And Iowa State had very, very um, science heavy courses. So it required me to take take honestly a, a good year of constant, constant studying and constant class taking um, for me to make that work. So I took a prereq um, year essentially at a community college and that was the way in which I could affordably pay for this. Um, and I just had a laser focus. I took all of the basic chemistry, physiology, math, statistics courses that you needed to successfully transfer to this accredited university. Um, and as I said, you know, I was lucky enough to be able to kind of help pad or fund my tuition with the large music scholarship that I got. But as I mentioned before, I mean, I was having practices for two hours a night for three times a week, had concerts on weekends when everybody else was going to football games and having fun with friends. And, you know, it really did all of those concerts took time away from my studying of medical nutrition therapy or biochemistry. So it required a lot of self-discipline and time management. Um, obviously, I, I packed a lot into a short amount of time. So I used my summer breaks as a time to not only get um, patient care experience, but also working experience and uh, continued to take online courses. I think I took a microbiology course online, which sounds weird, obviously not the lab part, but um, so really trying to do what I could um, to get as much experience in a short amount of time as I could. And I maintained that laser focus that year. So in terms of dietitian experience with patient care, it looks a little bit different than say a pre-med track or a pre-PA track where you might become a CNA or become a phlebotomist or something like that, a scribe maybe. Um, so I actually worked, it sounds kind of funny, I was like a glorified waitress in the hospital where I would take meals, orders down for patients and deliver meals to them. That was my dietary food experience um, in a hospital. But uh, I also, um, as Janie said, I've been very involved in social media really since it's 
kind of, um, since it's got its start, like I was on Instagram when it got its start. I remember having a blog before having a blog was cool. Uh, I, I wrote a blog in college actually when I was in um, the music conservatory about healthy lifestyles and I got picked up by USA Today. So I um, wrote as a freelance um, health and fitness writer for my local newspaper in Des Moines uh, while I was in college as well. So just like a lot of different stuff. Again, my journey is going to look different from yours, but just thinking about your skills and your interests and how you might be able to parlay that into legitimate experience for say um, a CASPA application or a pre-med um, application is, is great. So as I mentioned, you know, dietetics, uh, a lot of people don't realize how science heavy it is and how much science background we have as medical nutrition providers. Um, I had to take coursework that included anatomy, physiology in labs, biochem, organic and inorganic chemistry with labs, um, microbio, food science courses, medical nutrition therapy, um, and nu nutrition counseling, just to name a few. And I'm sure nowadays programs have even expanded upon that. Um, I, I I would really recommend if, if you aren't already um, getting some sort of experience within leadership, because I think the theme of leadership is so, so important as you apply to different programs, especially PA um, and any way in which you can show leadership, either in a volunteer group, a church group or a student led organization really sets you apart. So I knew that from the very beginning. And I threw my hat in the ring to become president of our Student Dietetics Association and for some whatever reason was nominated and uh, was able to um, lead that nutrition focused uh, group and led campus wide events and things like that. Um, volunteer hours are also a component to a well rounded application. So as a dietitian, you know, in prep for my dietetic internship, tried to get uh, volunteer hours in food pantries and kitchens and things like that. Um, and then utilize my summers to work pretty much almost full time, um, both within a uh, nutrition outpatient clinic. I was a, an administrative assistant. And then I, like I said, was the glorified waitress in the hospital. Um, so all of these activities really set me up for the internship and quite honestly, even for PA school later, because um, as some of you know, you're in the thick of the CASPA applications. You have to write down everything you've ever done in your entire life. <laughs> and it counts. So use that to your advantage. And um, there's no experience too diverse. Um, I find that one of the things that really set me apart when going to apply to my dietetic internship, but also PA school later is having that hands-on patient experience. So as Janie mentioned, you know, advanced clinical training offers that ability to do that um, from, a, from a virtual way and kind of on a as as you can um, basis. Uh, I forget what that word is. It's, it's escaping my mind, but um, um, you know, you're able to just do it in between your work or your life events. Asynchronous. Thank you, Emily. Asynchronous format. Um, and I think that's a great, great way to set yourself apart and really show that you're dedicated and serious. And I think what's even better is getting paid experiences if you can, just because that really emphasizes that level of pursuit and seriousness to whatever it is that you you're doing. Um, so again, you know, I mentioned the hospital work that I did, um, though it did count as direct patient care experience because I was patient facing. Um, so, you know, think, think creatively if you can with all of that. And Deirdre, I will answer your question here. Um, of all the science courses you took, which prereqs do you use the most in your current position? Oh my gosh. Um, I would say... I would say physiology because the, I'll kind of get to this later, but physiology is a very, very important concept within medicine and healthcare in general. And I find that if you can understand the reason for why something works in the body and kind of that form and function behind it, it helps you kind of bypass the need to just rote memorize everything. Um, you're able to kind of like piece through the processes and those functions in the body. And you're able to just logic your way through answers more on say exams or patient interaction. So physiology was always a favorite of mine. And I think that that is the most important prereq. Honestly, I don't use biochem at all. <laughs> uh, anatomy, that might, that might be another one that I use often, but um, yeah, a lot of the prereqs are just kind of ways to, really shock your system and just get you uh, prepared for that load of coursework later. So hopefully that answers your question. 
Um, so in addition, kind of taking a step back here, in addition to the hands-on patient experience, which I hope you pursue no matter what track you're interested in, um, patient, or excuse me, uh, provider shadowing, and I guess patient shadowing too, is also really important. So my I think the shadowing piece can be sometimes difficult for patients. It was really hard during COVID. Um, it was honestly close to impossible during COVID. So I, I'd say try your best with this. And if you currently work in the hospital, you know, you could argue your shadowing is just having the career path that you want to be if you work with them and they're your colleagues, then that counts as shadowing. So that's kind of what I did as a dietitian for PA school. Um, I worked with PAs, NPs, and was able to understand their role because I, you know, they were my colleagues and I worked with them often. But as a dietitian, for those of you who are in the, in the chat tonight um, and you're pursuing dietetics degree, uh, my first experience shadowing a registered dietitian was clinical. And it was literally a product of me you know, I had my little maid apron on and my cart of meals and I just knocked on the dietitian's door, the clinical nutrition office. And I said, Hey, here's my name. And I want to go to PA, uh, excuse me, dietitian, uh, school. I want to pursue dietetics and I'd love to shadow one of you. So it was kind of like a cold call or just a informal way to introduce myself. And they said, Hey, absolutely. We'd love to have you shadow us. When can you, when are you free? So you really, if this is another theme of the night, I want to encourage you that you really just don't get what you don't ask for. And you never know the worst, the worst thing that can happen is somebody says no to you. So shoot your shot, you know, throw caution to the wind and just put yourself out there over and over and over again. And if you are somebody you think, oh my gosh, I'm an introvert or I don't think I could ever do what Caroline did, you know, just try, give yourself a little bit of exposure therapy, try it once and keep trying it. Just, you got to give her, get over that hump. And I promise you, it gets easier the more you do it. So fast forward, I complete P, uh, my BS in, in dietetics and fast forward to my dietetic internship. Um, I, this is not to, to sound braggadocious, but it's just to say, you know, hopefully you can see that I really busted my tail in uh, nutrition, my nutrition schooling to set myself up for a dietetic internship. And I tried to hit it from all angles. So I was lucky enough to match to my number one choice at the Minneapolis VA Medical Center. Um, I loved that program just because I love the Twin Cities. It was a paid internship, which I was very happy. Those are very few and far between as, as dietitians. Um, and I loved the just overall rigor of the program and the interactions that we got um, as students. So this is baby Caroline here and all my fellow um, dietetic interns. We had one male dietitian who um, we kind of gave a lot of jokes to. But so this, as I mentioned, was over a thousand hours of supervised clinical practice with dietitians as our supervisors. We rotated in different areas, including cardiology, cardiac rehab. Um, the VA that I was at had a special emphasis on spinal cord injuries and traumatic brain injury, um, as well as MS and some degenerative diseases like that. Um, had rotations in psychology because, again, working with veterans, a lot of our patients had pretty severe PTSD related to combat or what have you. Um, I, I rotated in gastroenterology, um, renal and dialysis. There was a huge dialysis center on campus there. And then we did go off site for pediatric nutrition um, because obviously our veterans are not gonna be pediatric age. Um, I had rotations at uh, school-based uh, programs in the Twin Cities area. And then probably the most impactful for me and what made my internship the most unique was that we had a specific rotation at a place called the EMILY program in the Twin Cities, which is an eating disorder rehabilitation program. They had both outpatient and inpatient programs, and they focused on the dual diagnosis of bulimia nervosa and or anorexia nervosa plus type 1 diabetes. So got a lot of great foundation with um, just overall diabetes and endocrine pathophysiology, as well as the kind of psychosocial components of eating disorders. And I got to see some, unfortunately, pretty, pretty severe cases there. Um, 
So as you can see, you know, as dietitians, we do a lot and we're very involved in lots of medical specialties. And so I really got to learn how to provide that medical nutrition therapy plan um, for both critically ill and chronically ill patients, both in and outpatient. Um, and then as you can see here, we did some community-based intervention, some volunteer projects. There was a Ronald McDonald house that we would uh, volunteer to cook meals for and things like that. So internship for dietetics was a very pivotal point in my career. And I learned learned a lot and it really set me up well for my first job. So after graduating from that internship, I passed my boards, um, got my licensing, and then <laughs> never say never, guys, I started working in pediatrics. Pediatrics was totally out of my comfort zone. It was, I got like a month of it. I had zero to no little experience, little to no, excuse me, experience in it. And yeah, it was just never a, a thing I thought I'd do. Um, I was really searching endlessly for jobs at the time. This was in 2017. And I couldn't really find much in the city I lived, but luck and a little bit of preparation were to have it um, that I reconnected with an old classmate. I was actually advocating for um, the dietetic profession on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. I was invited with um, my Iowa Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics to go. And uh, she, an old classmate of mine was on the trip and we reconnected. She told me about a job opening. So had I not been in that situation and had, had I not gotten connected with that uh, organization, been on that trip, made that connection during college, and then had that conversation, I would have never gotten my first job. So um, additionally, uh, the job happened to be, it was a children's hospital that was associated with the hospital that I was the little glorified waitress um, in college. So I happened to know the clinical nutrition manager because I shadowed the dietitians when I knocked on the door and I had her put a good word in for me because over the years we kind of got to know each other. So again, understand the power of your network, understand the power of connections. I can honestly say I have never gotten a job just straight applying. I've only ever gotten jobs based on my network and who I know. Um, you know, not saying that's the only way to do it. I'm sure some of you have gotten jobs from just sending your application, but it's just not worked out that way for me. And so I think for me, especially the, the network has been really, really important. So I will say that becoming a dietitian has definitely, at least so far, I'm a new PA, so I can't speak a lot to it yet, but it has opened up the largest amount of opportunities for me. And I'm really glad that I started out as an RD. Um, I felt that it was the best way in which I could really, in a profession, blend my passions for prevention and lifestyle into a caring profession, right? We're caring people in healthcare. We wanna do what's best for patients. So nutrition for me was the way to do that. In addition to the fact that it, it, it unlocked so many different worlds for me. So um, I, I've worked at Mayo Clinic. I've worked at some Midwest-based uh, teaching hospitals. I've always worked in academic medical centers. So just being in that sort of environment, working as a clinician, you also have this expectation to become a researcher and an educator. So, um, you know, I've, I've, I'm glad to say that I've done all of that. I've precepted students, I've published papers, and I've, I've treated patients. So my first position as a registered dietitian, in case people want to know and learn more about job shadowing and what's out there, um, was obviously in pediatrics, but more specifically, I worked in ambulatory clinics associated with inpatient, uh, excuse me, um, internal medicine, I, I mean to say subspecialties. So things like endocrinology, gastroenterology, uh, pulmonology, asthma, things like that. Um, I worked in an aerodigestive clinic. So for babies and, and toddlers who have, um, you know, uh, malacia and different softening of the airways and so therefore have feeding difficulties. Granted, pediatrics, the scope kind of is, is pretty large because you see um, anything from zero days old infants all the way up to 18 years old. So across that very large developmental uh, span and continuum, you see a lot of different disease processes. Um, but luck had it that I always throughout my little job hops, um, I worked as a cystic fibrosis dietitian. So that's kind of was my bread and butter and my niche specialty and kind of where I built a name for myself as a dietitian. I was the lead CF dietitian at the accredited center for Mayo Clinic, as well as um, the Blank Children's Hospital uh, CF Center in Des Moines, Iowa. And so I found that this, and you'll hear it in a moment, was really what inspired me to 
pursue further, further education. But outside of clinical work, dietitian work has also allowed me to, again, kind of build on media work, freelance writing, um, and, and getting, getting involved in the communications piece, which I think nowadays is even more of a thing, right? Because we go to social media for our evidence-based information a lot of times, which a lot of times it's not, but that's another can of worms. So um, more on the CF clinic. So um, for those of you who don't know or know just a little bit, cystic fibrosis is a genetic lung disease that promotes the buildup of mucus in the areas of the body where there are tracts or little tunnels. So think respiratory tracts or lungs have tracts and tunnels. The GI system have ducts and tracts and the reproductive system. It really is a disease process um, that you are diagnosed with from birth and it affects the entire body. And it's quite, quite honestly, very debilitating. Um, these patients generally have a lot of trouble gaining weight, especially from, from a young age. And so they, for their entire life, require a high calorie, high fat, high protein diet. Um, so, uh, you know, all signs are pointing to the nutrition role and the dietitian role is very, very important to the overall positive growth and development of these children and really adults as well. Um, I won't get too much into the physiology of it, but essentially the We've got the pancreas, right? Um, which the pancreas has a lot of functions in the body, but one of the functions is to create enzymes. And those enzymes like lipase, protease, and amylase help us digest proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. And with the genetic defect that occurs in people with cystic fibrosis, um, there's a defect in the sodium chloride channels of these, of these ducts and these cells. And so as a result, um, fluid and sodium and chloride obviously can't cross. And so mucus, thick mucus builds up. And in the duct that connects the pancreas to the duodenum or the first part of the um, small intestine, that gets blocked and just filled with gunk. Um, and so the the enzymes that help digest the food don't get to where they need to go in the small intestine and therefore they have to require enzyme therapy. So the role of the dietitian in cystic fibrosis is we are the ones that kind of make recommendations on those enzyme uh, dosages. And um, as you can see here, this is published research that shows there is a legitimate direct correlation between FEV1, which is um, basically lung function as measured by a pulmonary function test and their BMI or their body mass index. Um, I think we all can argue that body mass, mass index is not the best nutritional marker, but it is what is evaluated for patients with cystic fibrosis. And you can see there's a pretty compelling um, data and graph here that says, you know, as our BMI increases due to being keeping up on um, oral intake and high protein, high calorie diets or lung function improves. So this is a field in which you're going to find dietitians working all over. And it was the, the field of medicine that really opened my eyes to the physician assistant track. And, you know, I got to work alongside pulmonologists. I got to read uh, x-rays and um, lung CTs and things like that. We got to look at PFT results together because again of this correlation here. And I was very well respected within my interdisciplinary team. And um, I think the fact that the physicians I worked with relied so much on the expertise of the dietitian, which happened to be me, I thought, you know, this is really exciting stuff. And I could see myself doing more, doing more for the patient. And so that is really um, brings us, I know this is a long story long, but it brings us to pivot number two. And I promise this will go hopefully a little bit faster. Um, we're already at 42 minutes, but I want to be mindful of your time. But, you know, I spent hundreds of hours ruminating on this process of applying. Do I apply to PA school? Do I make this decision? This is a, another huge, huge identity shift. And for me, uh, the timing just seemed right because at the time, uh, diet di dietitian degree expectations were changing. We need a master's degree now to practice, which I did not have. Um, salary limits, I felt, were, were very much a reality. And I was overall just kind of feeling a little unchallenged, if I would argue to say. I, I was still feeling so young in my career and already feeling like I was practicing at the very tip-top scope of um, scope of practice. So 
I decided I just threw caution to the wind and I applied. And the fun fact is the first time I applied, I got denied. <laughs> so I, I share that to be transparent with you. This was honestly um, a hit to the ego. And sorry, this is meant to say ego there and uh, forced me to really reevaluate my priorities. I thought, oh my gosh, like I, it's been a while since I've not been accepted to a degree program. And so this really forced me to think harder and take the next application seriously, which I did. Um, you know, other factors that I thought about, again, those little voices in my mind were things like lifestyle, money, family, age. I knew that I would be older than a lot of my counterparts as a non-traditional student, which some of the in the audience tonight are, and then other personal timelines. Um, I was not yet married at the time. I just a lot of reasons and arrows were pointing go for me. Um, and again, that I kept asking myself, like, am I crazy? And how am I going to pay for this? What about kids? Am I too old for this? So lots of questions going through my mind, as I'm sure there are for you in the audience. Um, for those of you who are wondering this question, like why PA for me? Uh, this was a career path that I very much respected the roots and origins of. Um, it got its roots in the military service. Individuals were trained um, to provide high level, level medical care to soldiers on the ground. Um, and with my VA um, military background and my dietetic internship, that just kind of made sense to me. And then it was an opportunity really to, again, take my credentials a step further and provide more for my patients while still utilizing my nutrition background. Something I've noticed in my work as a dietitian in healthcare um, is that very few physicians uh, know about nutrition and the impact it has on medical progress. Um, in addition to the fact it's getting better, but physicians in medical school receive very, very limited hours of nutritional education. Um, and it's, if they do, it's really really mostly on just vitamin physiology um, and not really the um, kind of hands-on nuts and bolts nutrition education that I find is so important for patients. So I saw this as a huge gap and a huge opportunity and was probably my main driving force for going to PA school because I thought, wow, as a PA, everything a dietitian can do is under that new scope. And so I'll be able to serve my patients holistically and just give them so much more. I also really, really admired um, for the profession the fact that PAs have lateral mobility. So what does that mean? Unlike a physician who uh, specializes and goes on to do fellowship, PAs can work in a lot of different specialties. So whether you want to do dermatology or aesthetics, or if you want to do endocrinology, which is what I work in now, you can switch. And I'm not going to say it's easy to switch, but you can. And uh, so that was very intriguing to me as somebody who worked in a lot of subspecialties as a dietitian. And then lastly, the team-based approach to healthcare. I've never wanted to be the physician calling the shots. Um, I love the team-based approach a lot more and just the overall collaborative nature of the specialty. So pre-PA in a nutshell, I know a lot of you guys are in the thick of it. After getting denied my first round of applications, I really took things seriously the next time. I spent hundreds of hours writing my personal statement, which I'm sure a lot of you are doing now as well. And I literally had everybody under the sun that I knew read it. Every, every degree, every career path, I had them read my statement. I was working full time as a dietitian, so that counted as my, um, you know, patient contact hours. And I also utilized my uh, benefit to, of tuition assistance to take summer courses. So I had a few online prereqs like abnormal psychology and developmental psych that I took over the summer. Um, so I was working full time as well as taking classes. And then I applied through CASPA, which if you are in PA school or, or um, applying to PA school, you know about. And in total, I applied to just four schools. I was pretty confident in the package that I brought. Um, and so I applied to much fewer schools than what's typically recommended. I typically recommend people apply closer to, to five to eight schools. Um, I would say eight is the average number that, that people apply to. Some apply to way more than that. Um, out of the four that I applied for, I was accepted to three and waitlisted at one. So got pretty good return on investment there. Um, if you're interested in knowing what schools I applied to, I'm happy to share that. Um, and then the interview process was pretty long and arduous, and it was during COVID. So that was on my side. All the interviews were virtual, but I had to make some pretty, pretty weird excuses um, <laughs> to miss work for those interviews because it was COVID season, right? And pretty much every side effect of like an illness was COVID. So had to get creative there, but that's a joke aside. But anyway, 
fast forward to PA school I'm in, can confidently say um, it's the hardest endeavor of my career to date. PA school is very, very difficult, but it is so worth it. Just like medical school, if that's what you choose to do, is going to be so worth it for you. The amount of information you consume in such a short time, it is truly like drinking from the fire hose. It's just outrageous. And I kind of blacked it out. Like sometimes I looking back, I don't even know how I how I did it, but you just do it, you adapt and you overcome. So it's possible. There are two phases to PA school. There's the didactic phase, which is the intense coursework. That's the part that everybody just dreads. And it's just the slog and the grind. Um, you take anatomy, physiology, biology of disease, clinical medicine, pharmacology, communication and med medicine and ethics, psych med, lab and terp, clinical skills lab, clinical research, um, medical documentation, and more. So it's all condensed. My personal program was 28 months in length, although there are uh, programs that are a little longer or a little shorter. Everyone is different, and it's very much kind of slightly comparing apples to oranges. And then you've got the clinical phase, which is um, a series of one to two month length rotations back to back to back for over a year. And this is a mix of required rotations and the you know bread and butter specialties. And then you get electives. The program that I went to, I went to the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha. And one of the reasons I loved that school was because of all the electives that you got to do. I got to do five elective rotations, which was quite a lot for PA school. Um, so here is just some pictures of the mix of didactic phase. And um, yeah, Emily, five is a lot. And that's why I chose that school. Not to mention, she's no longer, but the old associate director was a registered dietitian turned uh, emergency medicine PA. So she was a, a mentor of, me, of mine now and someone I really respect. So we did phlebotomy. We did um, casting, suturing, and splinting. Um, I did a lot of surgical electives because I wanted to challenge myself and do something out of my comfort zone in PA school. And I felt as a dietitian, I had pretty good basis on a lot of the internal medicine specialties, the more cerebral aspects. So I wanted to be more hands-on. So I did a dermatology rotation. You can see these are Botox vial, uh, syringes loaded up here and lidocaine um, and then I also, uh, did bariatric surgery. I did plastic surgery. Um, what else did I do? I did a nephrology rotation, dermatology, and then, oh, what else did I do? I'm blanking on the fifth one, but I'll think of it later. Um, we got to do point of care ultrasound and didactic. So lots there. And this was a guy on my emergency medicine rotation. I did that in a rural environment. He fell and this is an obvious shoulder dislocation that I had to uh, pop back into place. So that was kind of fun. Um, and then obviously I graduated and life after PA school has been blissful. <laughs> uh, it's been great. If you um, are in PA school or if you're thinking about it, it is a grind, but it gets better after. So um, have definitely been able to have a little bit more balance in my life now that PA school is done and have gotten to take some trips and just uh, focus on being a new grad. So my work now as a PA is um, working in endocrinology full time. Obviously, before you get uh, started with work, you have licensure, which includes, you know, your PA license, as well as your DEA license, which allows you to prescribe controlled substances. And that's uh, sometimes a, a required element to work. Um, and this took a lot of time before I was able to start. Uh, but right now I work at a large academic medical center. It's a level one trauma center. And I have a hybrid role where I work half day in the hospital, seeing critically ill patients admitted um, who have hyperglycemia. Glycemia, lots of reasons for having hyperglycemia, such as steroids, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, enteral parenteral nutrition, which can cause hyperglycemia, lots of reasons. Um, I also assist our OBGYN maternal fetal medicine group in managing gestational diabetes in clinic. And then in the afternoons, I maintain a hospital follow up clinic for those patients who are discharged. So I get to be involved in a lot of aspects of care. I love that I'm able to see both the inpatient world and the outpatient world. For somebody like me who gets a little ADD, I like that variety. I like staying busy all the time. I, I don't think I'm the type of personality who can do clinic all the time. I like to have that blend. Um, so I kind of talked about this, mostly working with patients with diabetes and thyroid diseases. 
Um, and I like it because the specialty of endocrinology, I get to use my nutrition, which was my number one goal. Um, but it's also very similar to primary care, right? Because uh, managing diabetes involves a lot more than just blood sugars. It involves blood pressure management, lipid management, eye health, and, and a lot of those screening tools. Um, so I, I like that you get that kind of flavor of primary care, but it's more specialized and a little bit more streamlined. Um, in order, so endocrine um, is very hands off as a medical specialty. It's all up here and it's all in the brain. Um, and so I thought I didn't want to lose my clinical skills, uh, such as suturing and hands on casting and things. So in order to keep those up, because I am a new grad, I've also taken a, a PRN or an as needed position in urgent care, where I will do that sort of a couple times a month. I'll moonlight here and there. And I've loved it um, just because in this role, I'm in clinic at uh, one of five. Uh, urban, pretty fast paced clinics. And I'm 100% autonomous. We have a supervising physician that's a phone call away, but he's not there in clinic with me. So I'm the one calling the shots and making diagnoses and prescribing meds and treatments, etc. And so it's been a great way to just keep up a lot of those family medicine slash internal medicine, primary care diagnoses that you got to keep up on. And it's allowed me to build those reps and see more patients. Last weekend, I saw 18 patients in less than five hours. So we might need to start wearing our masks again because it's getting bad respiratory season is. Um, but in this environment, you know, urgent care, a lot of physicians can moonlight in urgent care too. So it's a great option. Um, it's great for people who maybe work shift work and work 12 hour shifts three days a week and then want a little bit of extra way to pad your income. Um, but it, you never really know what's going to walk in your door, obviously. But it's a good mix of everything. You see ENT, palm, urogyne, ortho, derm, and it's very fast paced. Um, in addition to that, it's not by any means a full-time job, but I am um, on, on call sort of as needed to assist for, from an educator standpoint as well. And so I've stayed on to help my PA school um, with clinical skills, teaching, um, physical exam techniques, and all of that. So here was a picture of uh, us teaching uh, arthrocentesis as well as injections on a little knee model here. So kind of cool. Um, so that was a lot. We're almost at the hour. I want to try to save some time for questions. You know, um, themes when pivoting careers, everybody, I just want you to remember these things that I mentioned at the beginning, you know, never say never. People will always doubt you. They will always try to give you crap for making these big pivots, but the best revenge is just proving them wrong. <laughs> and it's important to remember that you all are exactly where you need to be in your process and in your journey. And I just really want you to have that faith and that, uh, that self-confidence and just sort of that honestly delusion to just go for it and give it your all. Um, I don't want you to ever underestimate the power of your social and professional network. As you can see from my personal experience, it really made all the difference for me. Um, and the world of healthcare is so small. So obviously you never want to burn a bridge either as you're making these career pivots. Um, but yeah, the bottom line is just to have confidence in your abilities and remember that honestly, success is just kind of repeating those small, same positive behaviors and habits over time until eventually you get to where you want to go. So with that, thank you so much. I am so, so happy to connect on socials. There's, this is my website my um, professional uh, Gmail account, as well as my Instagram. I'm pretty responsive via DM. So if you want to send me a message um, about questions related to PA school, dietetic school, um, I work with a lot of medical residents. So I like to think I know a lot about medical school and residency as well, just through osmosis. So, um, but want to save a couple remaining minutes for questions. So if anybody has questions, drop them here and I'll try to answer them. Um, Natalie asked, how do you compare undergraduate to PA school? They are worlds different. Um, so undergrad is like baby and then <laughs> PA school is like mama bear, papa bear. It is uh, very, very different in terms of the, the speed and the volume and PA school is very fast paced. I mean, I would have anatomy lectures that were sometimes, I kid you not, 500 slides and I had to get those and that was for one night, one night's reading 500 slides. And then the next day it would be another 500. So it sounds intimidating, but you really do rise to the occasion because it's just this like herd pack mentality. Everybody's going through it at once and you just do it. It's sink or swim. 
Um, it's, and yeah, and that was, that was it, but undergraduate was not as difficult for me personally. Um, and granted I was balancing a lot of things, but, um, undergrad is just a little more slower paced. So PA schools, uh, worth the effort for sure. Um, and Deirdre, I'm glad you're interested in endocrinology. I think it's a great specialty. The beauty of endocrine is it's a specialty that has sub niches within it as well. So you've got like bone health, osteoporosis, you've got pituitary and hormones, you've got diabetes, you have thyroid, thyroid cancers and all of those things. So it's a very, very big world that you can dive into. So Caroline, I do see some questions in the Q&A box. Do you have access to it? If not, I can read some out for you. Uh, yes, I think I do, actually. I, thanks for making me aware of that. Um, how would you recommend building or expanding your network after undergrad? Nowadays, I think LinkedIn has really taken a, a change for the better. So I highly recommend you get a LinkedIn. That was a required little homework assignment for my PA program. And I've actually gotten some, some like gigs and jobs on LinkedIn. So definitely make sure that's up to date. You've got a professional headshot on there. And I am a firm believer in cold calling and just reaching out to people and also asking, hey, does, do you know someone who knows someone? Um, being a recent post-grad who's currently looking for jobs, internships, I was wondering in your humble opinion, whether one would benefit more from an internship compared to working, mm, especially since I'm in the process of exploring healthcare careers. So, um, it depends, obviously, on what you're able to apply for and, and get. I, as I mentioned in my talk, am always a favor of paid work um, when you can get it. But I know that it's not always an option. So, you know, paid shadow or excuse me, shadowing and, and certificate programs, kind of like the advanced clinical uh, training offers is a great option as well. I honestly think they're both equally as good. Um, I would be kind of leaning toward the paid if it's a possibility for you. Um, but anything is great. You just want to want to get out there and get that experience. Did I ever consider medical school or would you say PA, PA path was always my true calling? Um, Miguel, thank you for that question. Um, I didn't consider medical school only because, like I mentioned, nobody in my family was in healthcare or medicine. So I never really even knew it was a possibility for me. I think medicine and medical school might have been a potential for me had I started from like high school and early college. Um, but just given the fact that I was exposed to the healthcare career so late, PA was all I ever considered. And I really like my role as a PA. I like my ability to not have to be on call as much. I like that I was able to get my degree in two years compared to the eight plus that physicians go through. Um, I like being able to not be the one where the buck stops with them, where if I have a question, I consult my supervising physician and work collaboratively with them to get the answer. So, you know, I don't know if you're set on medical school, but PA is a pretty awesome path. And I am, I am all about education on PA track. Um, question would be if there was ever a time where you doubted if going to PA school was the right decision. Um, yes and no, Michaela. I, a lot of the reasons I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the financial reasons why I went to PA school. I was able to double my salary going from dietitian to PA um, sort of overnight, if you would, right? Because once I got my job as a PA, my salary doubled, um, which was a, an amazing benefit. I mean, right, I put in the work and, and took on the student loans, which I'm now battling right now. But um, I, I really never thought or denied or doubted that it would be a, a wrong decision for me. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, and when it came, came to taking into consideration for the PA program, I kind of alluded to the electives and the philosophy of the program, um, but really wanted to think about um, finances. I wanted to live in a town where I could live comfortably and inexpensively. So I got into a school in Chicago, but I decided on a school in Omaha because rent was a lot cheaper. A lot of those just logistical decisions have to come into play. Um, and then additionally, uh, I went to a school that was top ranking um, in, in the ranks uh, across the United States. Um, I also never wanted to take the GRE. I'm a really bad standardized test taker. And so I applied to schools that that wasn't a requirement. So sounds funny, but those were my considerations. Um, 
After PA school, Miguel, is there a residency like component mm, where you work in your chosen field um, or interested field? That is PA fellowships are becoming a thing slightly more. Um, a lot of the times for specialties like internal medicine and uh, emergency medicine, a lot of times people require those uh, fellowships or residencies. So they exist, but they usually don't pay as much. And I would argue that as a uh, new grad or a new provider, you're, you always get an onboarding process. So that onboarding process where you're kind of mentored by your physician kind of acts as that residency. So I am not a fan of residency programs for PAs. I'm of the belief that you should just dive into work right away. Um, Let's see. One question I have from Reese is what was the difficult or challenging part uh, from the journey of being a dietitian and PA? I mean, hopefully my long discussion kind of outlined that it was just a grind to have to take a lot of the courses and make that that logistical shift. Um, it, it took a lot uh, of time and, and, and sacrifice, um, not to mention just the, the difference in types of courses I had to take. So um, what was someone, what was something I wish I knew before somebody uh, told me before beginning the PA grind from Anonymous? Um, I think something I wish I would have done is honestly prioritize my personal fitness and wellness more throughout PA school. I feel in a lot of ways, I kind of let myself go during PA school, gained a lot of weight, didn't make healthy choices, did not keep up on exercise. Um, that was something I really regret doing. And I gave a talk recently to this, um, organization about wellness, um, during your training. And I think it's so important that resilience emotionally, mentally, um, it's something I'm really trying to kind of keep up and work on again, now that I'm and, and work. So that's something I, I want you to remember is to never let that element go and your own personal health go. I think sometimes we forget it to take care of ourselves. We're so busy of taking care of others. So that's something I wish I paid more attention to. What would I recommend if the only C I have is organic chem lab? Do you recommend to retake or just strive for an A and or go to strive for an A in the next one? Don't even let a C bother you. I think I got a D once. Um, and so just move on. <laughs> That's my best advice. How do you deal with the gap between the end of PA school to and when you are able to start working? Good question. Um, are you talking about like finances and health insurance? If so, um, you're, I was able to stay on the insurance program and plan through my uh, university. And I actually started applying for jobs very early on in my clinical rotation. So I actually got hired on in August and I didn't graduate until December. And then I didn't start my job until February. So I actually had a job at, right out of graduation because I did due diligence to network and apply early um, because I have a chronic disease personally that I couldn't lose health insurance for. So I needed that piece. Um, I think there was maybe like one month of gap where I didn't have health insurance and I used like a Cobra type situation. Um, but if you play your cards right, you could definitely make it work. So I think that's all the questions. I'm sorry I'm six minutes over, you guys. Thanks for sticking it out with me. Hopefully you guys learned something. Hopefully this talk was helpful for you all. Thank you so much for your time tonight. This has been an amazing, um, amazing chat. And again, I like it more when it's engaging and I can hear from you, but you guys did a great job of adding to the chat. So thank you so, so much. Thanks, Caroline, and thanks everyone for joining. Be on the lookout for the link to the recording as well as some additional information about ACT certification programs. Have a good night. Bye-bye.